Well, hello and welcome to another week of the Dividend Cafe. Getting ready to go into a little holiday weekend. Um, I am sitting in the New York office uh, where I will tell you it's been very odd weather this week. We had several 12 degree mornings and then all of a sudden it got like up into the 60s and felt like it was 80 and so uh, it's interesting to see the kind of weather shifts, um, but nevertheless, this is uh, what happens this time of year in the winters of New York. And um, I believe that things have been kind of the opposite in my other coast where last week Southern California was having a dramatic heat wave. So we um, have up and down weather conditions and uh, we continue to have up and down market conditions, but I... I'm going to save you the boredom of talking more and more about volatility. And, and actually, it's probably not boredom, but I'm also going to save you from yet another conversation about Russia, Ukraine, where it's been discussed each uh, day in the DC Today, our daily market bulletin, which I hope all of you subscribe to, um, thedctoday.com for those who don't. And um, it's obviously being discussed ad nauseum in the press. Um, now, look, the bullet points that I offer on the subject each day with market specificity and implication uh, hopefully aren't boring, but regardless, they're at least, I can promise you, accurate and shared in good faith and coming from a perspective of trying to give honest commentary for the purpose of, of understanding and clarity and market application, uh, where a lot of the information I think that you may get in other sources it, some of it may be right. I wouldn't take that for granted, but it could be. Uh, but, you know, it's it, there's an agenda and why it's being shared. And and so we're here to try to be neutral uh, presenters of information and yet not neutral in, in where we apply, you know, how we have a point of view as to how we believe investment perspective ought to be carried out on behalf of clients' uh, financial goals. So the Russia-Ukraine thing continues, but um, I, I make the comment in DividendCafe.com today that I don't think we're going to be talking about it in six months. I'm not totally sure we're going to be talking about it in six weeks, but I'm less sure of that than, than I feel on the six-month side. Where the thing I want to get into a little bit today, inflation, interest rates, the Fed, um, I believe we're going to be talking about that in six weeks, six months, six years, and, it, and with a lot of ebb and flow around the way. But this is the topic that is far more relevant you know, to me right now in the way in which we allocate client capital. And, and I think that the way I worded it in Dividend Cafe is the way I want to start our conversation right now for the podcast listeners and video watchers. What is the question to be asking? Um, I've probably done a little more than I've needed to about trying to point out the nuances and particularities of the backward looking inflation rate. So I do think it's relevant and I do think it's noteworthy when I point out, you know, you get a 7.1 CPI and 29% in used car sales. And, and what does that look like in terms of understanding the inflation that we've had price escalations from 2021? But if someone were to say, hey, Dave, you got to make some investment decisions for the future. What do you think about last year's inflation? I'm not sure that would be the right question. And one of the reasons is I can most certainly assure you it's not the questions the Fed is asking. And for those who believe that what the Fed ends up doing has sort of some sort of relevance, you know, they are asking what will inflation be in a year? And I think that this is important for a couple of reasons. It is important because I think it's what the Fed's looking to do. It is important because it makes a bigger difference to me in how I think about forward-looking capital allocation, uh, interest rates, uh, va the valuation around assets, things like that. But um, I also think that it acknowledges the just unbelievably clear reality that there is some noise in the inflation data that is very likely to get less noisy a year from now. Gone altogether, I don't know um, how much of the current inflation is related to the noise. I don't know that either. But it, it seems to me someone has to be either dishonest, which is very common, or uninformed, which might be pretty common too, 
to act as if there's no import from the noise of the supply chain disruptions, the port closures or delays or inefficiencies, the truck driver shortages, the, the labor inadequacies. Um, I, I don't know what the bottlenecks mean to price escalations in a quantifiable sense, but there is one, I guess I'll say there's two numbers that I can rule out as to what their level of relevance is. 0% at 100%, okay? So I'll take both of those theses out. But I think that when people are talking about the 7% inflation rate and the, and the highest since this and that and the other, and not when they know better, when they're not looking to a forward-looking exhortation, be, I think they're missing an opportunity because my view is that if you have 3 to 4% inflation, that is double the Fed's target. So, so no one who's talking about there being three to 4% inflation is talking down anything. They're referring to the fact that for various reasons that warrant unpacking, there, if there was three to 4% inflation, there would be dramatically higher inflation than we had pre-COVID and that we um, have targeted as a matter of monetary policy at the Federal Reserve. And yet, by going to the seven number backward looking instead of a yet still higher number forward looking, I think that we are setting up a narrative change. And that narrative change is going to be relevant to actual Fed policy. And this is what I mean. The pressure, I, I start off giving cafe today. Um, well, okay, I'm going to back up if you don't mind. I believe that politicians love inflation. I do not believe politicians worry about inflation. I do not believe politicians are concerned when prices are going higher and it's hurting constituents. I believe they worry about inflation and start talking about it when it gets so high that their constituents notice. And I think there's some number at which people live with it and it, it, do, it does damage to them and it's not good, and sometimes the policies that created are unfair, but nevertheless, the slowness of it, the minimal gravity of it, enables people to just sort of live with it. And let's say that number is between one and 3% of an annualized inflation rate that still, I would point out, is having purchasing power. It's cutting in half purchasing power every 25 to 35 years, if it's somewhere between two and 3%. Um, so I think that that's a significant reality of financial planning, but I don't think politicians care and I don't think the people care enough to make politicians care. So then now why is there all this noise around inflation? Well, because the numbers have gotten so much higher coming out of COVID, the massive demand surge, the supply chain shortages, we know that um, there was a whole lot of government spending put on and people figured that plays in somewhere. They're not exactly sure how, and, and I have thoughts on that. And then of course the, the monetary side of it. Um, but here's the thing. If the inflation rate is at 3% next year or three and a half, you tell me what you think the headline is gonna be. Inflation double what it had been pre-COVID or inflation half of what it was a year ago. This is where I believe Fed policy is gonna come from, is that the uproar over elevated inflation by focusing on the sensationalistic aspects of a seven handle, backward looking, instead of where we could still see elevated price inflation in housing and rents, um, potentially still in food, but I hope those food shortages end and then I expect still in, in the energy side. And, and uh, instead of focusing on that, by focusing on the backward looking side where there are these noisy contributors to it, I think we're setting the stage to take focus off of inflation. And then what will happen is a Federal Reserve, who I do not believe wants to tighten monetary policy above and beyond the minimum level needed to achieve a couple things, then we'll have the cover to hit the pause button. 
And yet this requires like three things happening at once. They're trying to thread a needle. Uh, they have to get off the zero bound. I'd like it to be closer to 2%. I'd take one and a half. But I think they're going to have to end up being content at around 1%. Maybe, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe it's a little higher, but I still feel comfortable saying something with a one handle um, at the most. Okay. And they need to get a few trillion off their balance sheet. Um, the number is probably about three trillion. If you look at what they've added to the balance sheet, less the reverse repos, I think that they would feel like they had at least gotten to some equivalent of pre-COVID in a um, three trillion reduction. But there, the Fed is not unaware of the leverage in our financial system, the amount of M&A transactions and leverage buyouts that have taken place with a low cost of capital in mind, heavy degree of liquidity in the financial markets. The Fed's not unaware of the volume of levered loans, of the quality of companies that have been able to access the high yield bond market. And if all of that leverage is then undermined as credit markets tighten, it forces the Fed's hand. And I know people say, well, yeah, well, then they're just going to press further. I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Um, the, the Fed does not want to be uh, politically engaged, and it doesn't matter what party it is. If you are going through that kind of a, a period where you're voluntarily forcing pain upon the markets, and that is obviously, in that case, going to be significantly recessionary. It doesn't matter if it's a Republican or Democrat in office. The Fed, doesn't, the Fed is going to be blamed regardless of who it is. And that's not the role they want to play. They want this sort of institutional credibility, institutional independence thing. And, and so I feel very strongly that they have a threshold of how much they can push this. And if, if all the stars are aligned for them, they would be very happy. If they could get a couple trillion off the balance sheet, if they could get the Fed funds rate up to one and a half, one, somewhere higher than zero, and, and, and then right at that time that inflation, has, the rate of which is lowered, then they could say, okay, well now we kind of need to take a pause before the credit markets end up rebelling. That to me is the timeline of where we're headed. So if you look forward and you see a three or four inflation rate, you do not see something in, in a year from now that people that um, should be thought of as a wonderfully low inflation rate. But however, I believe that's how it'll be perceived relative to six or seven because of all the, the conversation and noise now. And then the Fed will be able to use that to pivot off of a policy that is pushing them to inverting the yield curve, drive recession, drive credit market revulsion and then back off and become the coddler of risk assets yet again. That's where they'd like it to go. Any number of things could throw off that chain of events. But um, these are the questions that I think need to be asked. These are the um, ways I recommend people view these things and having a forward looking view to prices helps one formulate a forward looking view to interest rates and therefore asset prices and therefore Fed policy and therefore macroeconomic conditions, so forth and so on. And I think it's a lot more useful than the, the backward looking narrative that is less useful in the here and now. Um, I've, I've given you enough to chew on there. I absolutely recommend you read Dividend Cafe today. The, the written version is always different than what I'm saying here in the podcast or the video. More charts, more uh, uh, you know elaboration. And uh, I'm a fan of the written word. And so I hope you all will be as well. But you know what? Not everyone is a fan of the written word these days. A lot of people love the podcast medium and we'll take that as well. But if you're going to love the podcast medium, please subscribe, put it in your feed. It helps us and hopefully helps you. Thanks for listening to and watching the Dividend Cafe. Mm -hmm.